Addendum to file address by President Hikora Sati of United Earth. Shortly after the declaration of the First Veral War. Citizens of United Earth, today we embark on the great mission in support of our neighbors. The Chiwa, since we have met them, have only asked one thing, to be left to their own devices, to be left to themselves, and to be able to live their lives undisturbed. They have been silent neighbors, but they have left us in peace with no reservations, only that we respect their borders and boundaries. We have had our minor disputes, but they have always been there to discuss them, always willing to find a compromise. They do not dream of a star-spanning empire, nor do they wish to force their will on others. In the past hours we have learned much of the Shua, how each citizen of their republic is expected to grow and tend a garden once they reach adulthood. The Chua believe that self-sufficiency and personal responsibility to not only the individual but their environment is a virtue of the highest standing, and the worlds of the Chua Republic are lined with such gardens. The Chua grow their gardens as a reflection of their life, some ordered and road, some chaotic and natural, but all are expressions. The Chua say you can tell a lot about someone by looking at their garden. The Vral, on the other hand, only hold power as a virtue and we have seen what they do with that power. You have made your opinions known, on social media, to your representatives, and now we have made our opinion known to the galaxy. Those of you unfortunate enough to have seen the depravity of the broadcasts from the Vral Empire, understand this even better than most. You have demanded action, and your representatives have answered the call. In the most recent Galactic Senate Assembly, the Vral have declared war against the Chua Republic. The Chua gave them no cause. They made no offense that would give the Vral any reason to attack. The Chua are no threat to the Vral and have made no mentions of interfering, not because they did not view what the Vral were doing as wrong, but because they did not have the strength to do so. End of addendum. Personal recollection of Tiziki Kun Azikia Kakiat Kata, also known as Tika, Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate, Head of Diplomatic Relations Council, Turinica Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council. Second partition. Begin Log. What eventually became known to the wider galaxy as the First Orion War, and what the humans called the First Vral War, was barely twelve days old. The humans had met the Vral at the edge of the Shoth system. I had watched Tombs and his aides with compassion as the stories from the front began to come in. My own people still sing a song of the bravery of the United Earth First Fleet, the first to arrive, diving into the fight between the Chua and Vral, saving the Chua fleet from annihilation and holding the line even as the odds began to stack against them. As the United Earth Second, Fourth, and Fifth Fleet arrived to relieve them, Tombs was already speaking about the station. As we passed under the shadow of the battleship completely, I finally turned my eyes to the station. I still remember Tombs when he spoke of the pace of its construction. I never saw it in person. None of my people have. Now, almost ninety years later, I'm seeing it for the first time. Designed as a small refueling outpost, the entire station had been overhauled at an almost reckless speed. At the start of the First Vral War, it was barely two kilometers long. Now it was almost two hundred. Great Mother, I heard the trill from one of the younger aides, but I didn't look back to see who had broken the silence. No one was speaking. We all were looking at the station. If the ships of the Terran front filled me with a promise of dread, then Thermopylae Station filled me with awe and disquiet that shook me down to my chest. There was nothing beautiful or powerful looking about Thermopylae. Thermopylae Station was a wound in space that had never, and would never, heal. They say the station was built with the hulls of broken ships that limped or were towed back from the front. Kazia whispered to us all. The armor plate was welded into place to provide extra protection. The weapons, shields, everything. Thermopylae showed all the evidence of those words being true, and I knew it was true. Thermopylae was a floating hulk, with scars that had been repaired but never replaced. New plates had been welded next to what remained of corvettes and destroyers. Next to gashes through the armor of the station sat weapons pods, hard sealed into place. Missile silos larger than transports, rail guns, magnetic accelerators, beam weapons, and more than a fair amount of weapons of Chua design sat dotting the hull. 
Entire sections were visible that had been patched where the pockmarked and scarred hull of the station had been burned, scarred, or penetrated. As I let my eyes follow the abstract lines of the hull, I saw a ship designation symbol, UES-2265, and a name, UES Bonneville. I felt my mind drifting back to Tombs again, back to the Galactic Senate offices where I stood with Tombs those ninety years ago. Word has come in that the first is so badly mauled it's been cycled completely back to Shoth Prime to help the evacuation, he had said to me. I rustled my feathers in sympathy. Your other three fleets, they hold? I had asked, and Tombs had nodded. Barely. They might be able to hold the line for a month, maybe two. But every estimate we have heard of didn't even scratch the surface of how many ships they have. He had leaned back into his chair as I nestled myself on the perch he had supplied for me to rest comfortably in his office. Even our own, I had been concerned. Our intelligence was usually top of the line, beyond doubt. Even your own, Toombs had said to me. Human faces are so expressive. Sometimes I'm jealous of the way they can convey their exact emotions at just a glance. To show what he was feeling, I would have had to do a small dance, frill my crown, droop my wings. I wasn't jealous of his emotion then. What shall you do? I had asked, watching the human as he looked at me. Toombs leaned forward and placed his hands on the table. United Earth Command has picked up three other fleets converging from different points in Vral space towards the Shoth system. When they hit, if we're not in fighting retreat, we're going to be overwhelmed. Toombs's hazel eyes had locked onto mine. Ambassador, it's that time of day again. I had nodded graciously to him, knowing what was to come. Every day since the outbreak of the war, he had said the same thing. United Earth and its ally, the Chua Republic, request your assistance in combating this shared threat to the peace and prosperity of our nations. Toombs said, opening his hands towards me. I had folded my wings and bowed my head as I had done every day prior. I will relay your request to my government and thank you for the regard you show us. The corner of his mouth had twitched, and he had lowered his head then. Chua space is... well, finished, he said, which had alarmed me. If we try to hold them, we'll lose Chua, Andreas, Antares, Alpha Centauri, Earth. Do the Chua agree with this assessment? I had asked, feeling my heart swell with sorrow, knowing that soon the Vrawl would be broadcasting yet again. Toombs gave a half-smile, something I knew from my time with the human that meant that he wasn't going to enjoy what he said next. It was the Chua that had to convince us. He had breathed in sharply when he reached the end of that statement and looked away. Emotions seemed to war across his face. Grief, sadness, resolve, a calabash of visible sorrow and fury. We were prepared to... His words fell away again and his eyes looked down to the table. He breathed in. Then he seemed to regain himself. They convinced us. Toombs had just stared at me then and I felt the gravity of his words. They have proposed a plan, and United Earth has signed off on it. Are you at liberty to tell me? I remembered asking. We are going to save as many Chua as we can, as much of their civilization as we can, as many of their people as we can. He then pointed at his desk where a map of the territory of the United Earth was embossed. I stood and looked down at the map as he motioned along a line of stars. We're going to engage in a fighting retreat along the Villamore Corridor here. Even now, we're evacuating as many people as we can out of Antares. And right here, his finger loudly poked down on the star system marked Kelvin. Here is where we will make our stand. I had slowly nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. The Chua had declared their own home was lost. They had convinced the humans to acknowledge that. Their strategy is a sound one. That system is a natural choke point between the hyperlanes. Tombs had smiled at that. Very practical people, the Chua. They also have proposed something else. A station. I had canted my head to the side at that. A station? Tombs had nodded, then he laughed. Some Chua commander got the idea when he was on board the flagship of the first and saw a woman remounting a bulkhead using duct tape. Duct tape? I had asked. Tombs had laughed. Let me teach you an ancient wisdom of my people. 
Toombs had said to me, still grinning as he leaned back and pulled open one of the drawers on his desk. It is a lesson handed down by great sages, the legendary words that have been proven true and without fault a billion times in the past. He had taken out a very thick roll of adhesive banding wrapped in a roll. I leaned forward and inspected the wheel-shaped roll of silvery adhesive, then looked to Tombs. If you can't duck it, fuck it, he said. Then he laughed. I was truly confused. I believe the canting of my head made him laugh all the harder, which only confused me more. It took over three years for someone to explain to me what that actually meant, and since then I have kept the wheel of adhesive called duct tape with me. I am loath to use it as I have so little, but indeed it has proven useful too many times to count. As I look now, ninety years later, on the station tombs it's spoken of, hull after hull had been stacked and sealed in place, armor had been sectioned and carved up, every harsh angle and scarred pit, an impact that had killed or maimed. The Chua and the humans had taken the refueling station and quite literally turned it into a bastion, using the broken hulls and bodies of their fleets to do it. The fleets of humanity had taken their wounded vessels and cannibalized them. I looked at the half-painted symbol of the U.E.S. Bonneville again, wondering how many had died on that ship before it had come here, during which war. In the end, the Rawls fleets arrived in full force and United Earth had been pushed back, when a ship was too damaged to continue, it was brought here, to be welded into place, to have its weapons stripped and applied to the ever-expanding hull of the station. The Vral had broadcast with glee as they invaded the planets of the Chua, and United Earth nearly erupted into full revolt against the retreat as images of the Chua being murdered, enslaved, or worse, were sent out to any receiver within their signal range. The gardens burned. Every so often the Vral made sure to broadcast images of captured humans. Those in particular were disturbing. Several United Earth ships had to put down mutinies to stop the crew or the captains themselves from rebelling against the fighting retreat, and a few ships charged to their deaths against the Vral. They were doing anything they could to stop the carnage. The Vral moved into United Earth space next, not even bothering to chase down the ships full of refugees fleeing from Chiwa territory. They followed the United Earth fleets all the way back down what the humans called the Vilmo Corridor, only stopping at Antares. One and a half billion humans were on Antares when the Vral arrived in the system. Antares was a lifeless rock now. It had been these past nearly ninety years. The Vral had broadcast the suffering of the humans there for decades afterward, only ceasing the broadcast in the last two decades. I would like to say that the humans of Antares did not scream or cry or beg. I'd be lying if I said that. But I will say this. The Vral were not the only ones broadcasting, and the humans of Antares did not die in vain. The Vral had very little broadcasts of humans running for their lives. They had little to no broadcasts of human cubs being taken from their birth givers. Torture, murder, they had those in abundance. But they had to be selective. The entirety of the Chives commonality had fallen and been pacified by the Vral in under a full cycle, around nine United Earth months. Antares was never subdued, from what we learned from drone footage and first-hand accounts. It was never even close to pacified. The humans of Antares fought the Vral through everything they threw at them. The Vral's naval superiority could not be challenged, but on the ground war when it got close in, they were completely unprepared for the pure ferocity of the humans. Their campaign stalled entirely in the face of the Antares resistance, when the Vral, after nearly twenty cycles, almost a year and a half, quit the planet and bombarded it from orbit. By the time that happened, Toombs had already left the Galactic Senate to attempt to make it through the blockade of the hyperspace lanes. He did not make it through, being caught by a picket trying to run a smuggler's lane through hyperspace. Toombs did not allow them to capture him alive his shuttle overloading its reactor as it was being boarded. After Antares was left a glowing ball hovering in the cosmos, the Vral made the jump into the Helna system. Two weeks later, the Vral jumped into the Kelvin system. Facing them was Thermopylae Station and all that remained of the United Earth and Chua fleets. I snapped back to the present again, my eyes popping wide as the feathers all along my spine felt electrified. We had just passed through the shield of the station. I hadn't been paying attention. The first Vral War had ended here, 88 years ago. 
The hulking, misshapen mass of Thermopylae anchored and protected the humans and the Chua, even as it exacted a horrific toll against the Vral. Positioned too close to the hyperlane to bypass, and with the reach of its weapon systems so far, it was a plug to hold the bottleneck of the United Earth Core systems. The Vral battered themselves bloody as the humans and the Chua performed acts of absolutely suicidal bravery. I still remember sitting on my perch in my office as we watched the drone footage updates. The Vral's battle line trying to press. United Earth ships on the verge of coming apart at the seams fighting back. All the while, Thermopylae Station hammered endlessly against the invaders. The Chua protected transport after transport arriving at Thermopylae, sacrificing themselves so that ammunition, food, and supplies could get through. For two months, the Vral hurled themselves at the station and the fleet, trying to break them. Human and Chua ships would engage, fall back, repair, and in some cases be added to the mass of Thermopylae. The armored fist of the Vral military finally gave way, and the hulking masses of their battle fleet that were still capable fell back into Helena. The first war ended in much the same way it was declared, with the Vral ambassador coming before the Galactic Senate and announcing the war was over. The second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth Vral war had all ended much the same way, right here with this floating mass of a station being the anchor that held the tide of the Vral back. As I felt the shuttle's pads touch down on the deck, I prepared myself to exit the shuttle. I stood slowly and made my way to the back towards the ramp that would flower open to allow me to step foot on Thermopylae Station. Just before one of my aides could reach out and tap the panel to allow that, I held up my hand and furled my wings. I took a deep breath in and craned my neck from side to side in a rare showing of discomfort. We are the first diplomatic mission that has been requested from the Galactic Senate in over 81 cycles by the humans. Most of them will not live longer than 120 cycles. A generation to them is 25 cycles, I said, turning my head to look at each of them in turn. That is over three generations of humans between the last time we contacted them and now. All of you know your assignments, I do not doubt that. I looked back to the panel for the door. I do not, however, know what the humans intend, or why they have specifically requested our species and myself to come. Three things I demand in our time here. One, stay to your assigned areas. Two, the last time I knew them, humans like to gamble. Do not gamble with the humans, for you will lose. A few small trill sounds of laughter sounded, and I reached for the panel, but then I stopped myself. And three, remember where you are. We will be assigned a liaison, and if you don't know if an action would be considered disrespectful, ask. Do not do the action first, then ask later. My mind went back to my first sight of Thermopylae Station floating amid the Terran Front Armada, a nightmarish collection of broken hulls and weapon systems forged from corpses of vessels that had held United Earth's defenders. For a moment I was silent, as suddenly a thought came to mind that I wish had not. But now that it had come, I couldn't shake it. I never read anywhere that when Thermopylae had been built, or in any brief, I had gotten afterward, that there had been any kind of attempt to retrieve the dead from inside broken segments of the hulls by which I was now surrounded. We are standing in a graveyard of their heroes. Do not forget that for one moment. I reached out and tapped the blue panel. It glowed white and the inner workings of the shuttle spread apart. The ramp began to extend as I took my breather clip from a panel and attached it to my beak even as the wash of air from the hangar billowed my robes behind me. I slowly drew in a lung of air, feeling the breather clips draw against my breath as it filtered the gases the humans breathed that would be dangerous to me. Down the ramp, I saw a human standing with his arms at his side, his hand pulled to his brow in a salute, but my eyes were drawn to a mural on the hangar's exit partition, the last thing anyone would see leaving the station. What is that? What does it say? One of my aides whispered to another. I stared up at the mural. I had seen the picture that the mural was modeled after. One of the last images of Antares, a shirtless human. Blood rolling down an arm with a club in hand. Three dead Vral assault soldiers at his feet. The human was facing the camera, looking toward the sky. His left hand was raised, his middle finger held up in what I knew to be a gesture considered obscenely insulting to the humans. The words of the text were the battle cry of Antares. Shortened in some cases, but the meaning not forgotten. It's from a picture called The Final Word of Antares. 
I said, feeling the chill running along my spine once more. The words say, Better to die on your feet than live on your knees.